So this is The Man from Ironbark by Banjo Patterson. It was the man from Ironbark who struck the Sydney town. He wandered over street and park. He wandered up and down. He loitered here, he loitered there, till he was like to drop. Until at last, in sheer despair, he sought a barber shop. Here, shave my beard and whiskers off. I'll be a man of mark. I'll go and do the Sydney toff up home in Ironbark. The barber man was small and flash, as barbers mostly are. He wore a strike your fancy sash. He smoked a huge cigar. He was a humorist of note and keen at repartee. He laid the odds and kept a tote, whatever that may be. And when he saw our friend arrive, he whispered, Here's a lark. Just watch me catch him all alive, this man from Ironbark. There were some gilded youths that sat along the barber's wall. Their eyes were dull, their heads were flat, they had no brains at all. To them the barber passed the wink, his dexter eyelid shut. I'll make this bloomin' yokel think his bloomin' throat is cut. And as he soaked and rubbed it in, he made a rude remark. I suppose the flats is pretty green up there in Ironbark. A grunt <laughs> was all reply he got. He shaved the bushman's chin, then made the water boiling hot and dipped the razor in. He raised his hand, his brow grew black. He paused a while to gloat and then slashed the red hot razor back across his victim's throat. Upon the newly shaven skin, it made a livid mark. No doubt, it fairly took him in, the man from Ironbark. He fetched a wild up country yell. Ah! Might wake the dead to hear. And though his throat, he knew full well, was cut from ear to ear. So this is called The Man from Waterloo, with kind regards to Banjo, by Henry Lawson. It was the man from Waterloo, and working town was slack, who took the track, as bushmen do, and humped his swag out back. He tramped for months without a bob, for most of the sheds were full, until at last he got a job at picking up the wool. He found the work was rather rough, but swore to see it through, for he was made of sterling stuff, the man from Waterloo. The first remark was like a stab that fell his ear upon. Twas, there's another something scab the boss has taken on. They couldn't let the townie be. They sneered like anything. They'd mock him when he'd sound the G in words that end in ing. There came a man from Ironbark, and at the shed he shore. He scoffed his victuals like a shark, and like a fiend he swore. He'd shorn his flowing beard that day. He found it hard to reap, because twas hot and in the way while he was shearing sheep. His loaded fork in grimy halt was poised, his jaws moved fast, impatient till his throat could bolt, the mouthful taken last. He couldn't stand a something toff, much less a jackaroo, and swore to take the trimmings off the man from Waterloo. So this particular poem is called After You written by Peter Blythe. The sun was hot already, it was barely eight o'clock. The cocky took off in his ute to go and check his stock. He drove around the paddocks checking weathers, ewes and lambs, the float valves in the water troughs, the windmills on the dams. He stopped and turned a windmill on to fill a water tank and saw a ewe down in the dam a few yards from the bank. Typical bloody sheep, he thought. They've got no common sense. They won't go through a gateway, but they'll jump a bloody fence. The ewe was stuck down in the mud. He knew without a doubt she'd stay there till she carked it, if he didn't get her out. But when he reached the water's edge, the startled ewe broke free, and in her pace to get away began a swimming spree. He reckoned once her fleece was wet, the weight would drag her down. If he didn't rescue her, the stupid sod would drown. Her style was unimpressive. The survival chances slim. He saw no other option. He would have to take a swim. He peeled his shirt and singlet off, his trousers, boots and socks. And as he couldn't stand wet clothes, he also shed his jocks. He jumped into the water and away that cocky swam. He shortly caught up with her near the middle of the dam. The ewe was quite evasive. She kept giving him the slip. He tried to grab her sodden fleece but couldn't get a grip. At last, he got her to the bank and stopped to catch his breath. 
She showed him little gratitude for saving her from death. She took off like a Bondi tram around the other side. He swore next time he caught that ewe, he'd hang her bloody hide. So this poem is called Who's Doing the Dishes? And it's written by me. We have a medical mystery that has stumped our family physician. Our children all seem to be afflicted with this recurring condition. We have tried different foods as recommended by a dietitian and consulted a French professor, the world's leading paediatrician. But still, no one can solve the mystery of what happens after we eat. Our children seem quite normal until we mention that dinner's not complete until the dishwasher's packed, the table's wiped and the kitchen is all done. But that is the moment when this strange sickness overcomes every single one. The disorder takes a number of forms and changes every single night, which is why I'm guessing it is so hard to solve our unhappy plight. The first symptom is predictable. Someone's busting to go to the loo, although they never seem quite sure if they need to do a wee or a poo. One daughter says, I need more food to satisfy my growing appetite. Surely, as good parents, we wouldn't want her to be hungry through the night. Our youngest daughter falls asleep at the table to help digest her food. We dare not risk waking her and experiencing her sleep-deprived mood. But still the problems continue, with apparently the teacher to blame. My teacher said I had to finish my homework, I hear one child exclaim. Sweaty armpits is the next culprit as I hear another call, shower! Perspiration must have been bad. We don't see her for the next hour. My son starts sweating and convulsing. His vital signs start to diminish. Please take me to my video game. I just have this level to finish. Well, that takes care of the most common symptoms, but still they come up with others. My daughter wants to upload a selfie so her friends can show their brothers. My favorite TV show is on. I wouldn't dare think of missing it. Next, a disaster to manage. The emergence of a big zit. A glass of milk helps my growing bones. I need to take the dogs for a run. I've heard that it is important for kids to relax and have some fun. They're being quite creative, with more excuses than a politician. The kitchen is now deserted. They've vanished faster than a magician. This scene is repeated every night. I wonder how my wife will cope. First, one legitimate excuse has now led us down this slippery slope. I wonder how this developed. Is it learned or is it genetic? I think we need more research on this. Well, maybe I'm just being pathetic. At least my husband will help, says my wife. Otherwise, I'll be here all night. Um, I'll be back in a minute. I promise I just have this poem to write. <laughs> this is Clancy of the Overflow by Banjo Patterson. I had written him a letter which I had, for want of better knowledge, sent to where I met him down the Lachlan years ago. He was shearing when I knew him, so I sent the letter to him, just on spec, addressed as follows. Clancy of the Overflow. And an answer came directed in a writing unexpected, and I think the same was written with a thumbnail dipped in tar. Twas his shearing mate who wrote it, and verbatim I will quote it. Clancy's gone to Queensland droving, and we don't know where he are. In my wild, erratic fancy, visions come to me of Clancy gone a-droving down the Cooper where the western drovers go. As the stock are slowly stringing, Clancy rides behind them, singing, for the drover's life has pleasures that the townsfolk never know. And the bush hath friend to meet him, and their kindly voices greet him, and the murmur of the breezes, and the river on its bars. And he sees a vision splendid, the sunlit plains extended, and at night the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars. I am sitting in my dingy little office where a stingy ray of sunlight struggles feebly down between the houses tall. Um, tomorrow, smartphone user by me. I have myself a new smartphone. It does most everything. The device has features that would be fit for any king. I can instant message, email, text and SMS. I could probably do them all at the same time, I guess. I can browse the internet, see all the latest news use a tracking device to check on my pet kangaroos. I can download an app to do anything I want. View my heart rate, my banking, or the weather in Vermont. I can open up Facebook, Flickr, MySpace, and Bebo. These names would mean nothing only a few short years ago. I can play my best music with a flick of the touchscreen while taking photos and uploading my favorite scene. I was using it one day when I heard a strange ring ring. 
Never before had I heard this. It was such a strange thing. In some confusion, I looked at my email and apps. Was this some new feature I wasn't aware of, perhaps? I bumped a green button. Then I heard a familiar sound. It was a voice I knew too well, a woman well-renowned. How could I possibly hear it? Where was it coming from? I looked for the answer on wikipedia.com. So this is called Mulga Bill's Bicycle by Banjo Patterson. Twas Mulga Bill from Eagle Hawk that caught the cycling craze. He turned away the good old horse that served him many days. He dressed himself in cycling clothes resplendent to be seen. He hurried off to town and bought a shining new machine. And as he wheeled it through the door with air of lordly pride, the grinning shop assistant said, Excuse me, can you ride? See here, young man, said Morga Bill, from Walgett to the sea, from Conroy's Gap to Castle Ray, there's none can ride like me. I'm good all round at everything, as everybody knows, although I'm not the one to talk. I hate a man that blows. But riding is my special gift, my chiefest soul delight. Just ask a wild duck, can it swim? A wild cat, can it fight? There's nothing clothed in hide or hair, or built of flesh or steel. There's nothing walks, or jumps, or runs, on axle, or hoof, or wheel. But what I'll sit, while hide will hold, and girths and straps are tight. I'll ride this here, <laughs> two-wheeled concern. Ride straight away at sight. But thank you for coming along. Thank you for enjoying some poetry. Hopefully you enjoyed some poetry there. It's great to see Banjo still alive 120 years later. Thank you very much.